After the bracket has been modified, we bolt it to the engine using the original bolts. Then we attach the accelerator cable to the bracket. At times, we find a problem with the accelerator cable length. This is because of the different types of carburetors Ford used. We can order a 1980 cable that is listed under Ford part number EOFZ-9A758A. Also, if we decide to use the original air cleaner instead of an aftermarket unit, we will need to obtain a fiberglass carburetor offset mount available from the replicar manufacturer. This slightly relocates the air cleaner and allows proper hood clearance. After assembly, we test the unit to make sure it operates smoothly and doesn't bind. Following the details in the instruction manual, we fabricate a battery box for our replicar chassis. Alternately, a fiberglass unit in a high gloss black gel coat finish is available from the factory that allows clearance for mounting a heater as well as an air conditioning unit. We use Window Weld, which is a 3M product, available at most auto supply stores or automotive paint stores, and apply it to all frame areas that come into contact with the battery box. The reason we do this is to seal the engine compartment. We could use rubber weather stripping or good quality silicone sealer if we wanted. The battery box is centered, allowing it to overhang the chassis an equal amount on each side. If necessary, we may need to trim the sides slightly when we install the body. Following the instruction manual, we use our electric drill and drill holes through the front and rear mounting surfaces of the battery box and through the top of the frame surfaces. We use hex washer head self-tapping screws and secure the unit to the chassis. Later, when we mount the body, long bolts will secure the body to the frame going through the battery box. Here we have two floor liners for comparison as we must do some preliminary work prior to installation. We have almost finished our chassis at this point. We'll start with the emergency brake lever holes and the opening for the brake rod mechanism. Following the illustrations and text in the instruction manual, we first mark all dimpled hole locations as well as the scribe lines for the shift lever cutout with a china marker. We also mark a hole just to the center left of the transmission tunnel for the speedometer cable. As indicated in the instruction manual, a close fit is needed where the firewall meets the floor liner. So we next mark the front of the floor liner in order for it to be properly trimmed. The front corners and the flanges on the sides are marked and then will be trimmed. We always refer to the manual when any questions arise. Now we will use a drill with a 5 16 inch bit to open the holes we have marked we always use safety glasses. We will also, as shown here in the manual, cut out the opening for the transmission shifter. With a hole saw, we cut out the speedometer cable hole. We have used a saber saw with the appropriate blade to cut away all the marked areas. 
Now, we will install the transmission selector with four 5 16 inch bolts, approximately one inch long, and secure it using flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. Whenever we bolt through fiberglass, we use a flat washer under any bolt head or nut that comes into contact with the fiberglass. This spreads the tension of the bolt over a larger surface. Next, we slip the emergency brake handle into position with the rod and rubber boot extending through the hole at the rear of the recess. Two 5 16 inch diameter bolts, exactly the same as those used for the shift lever, are used to secure the emergency brake handle to the floor. All nuts are tightened, and our floorboard is now ready to be positioned on our tubular steel frame. Some rubber matting used for stairways is obtained from a local home center. We cut the matting in appropriate widths so that we can apply it to all areas of the chassis that come into contact with the floor liner. This will prevent any squeaks or rattles from occurring once we've mounted our floor liner. We use 3M 1300 rubber adhesive, available in a convenient tube, to glue the rubber strips to the frame. While we won't be wiring the car right now, this is the ideal time for us to run the wiring harness as it is secured to the inside of the driver's side main frame rail. Following the illustrations in the instruction manual, we secure this in position with metal clamps available from the electric department of our local home center or hardware store. We permanently attach the harness with self-tapping hex head screws. The floor liner can now be placed on our frame. We simply slide the liner in from the rear, lifting it upward to clear the brake pedal. Silicone sealer or window weld is used to seal the front of the floor to the firewall. We push the floor down and into position. When necessary, we can stand on the floor using our weight to push it all the way down against the frame. We use gloves to protect our hands during this procedure. Referring to our instruction manual, we mark all hole locations with a china marker. Our electric drill along with a quarter inch drill bit is used to drill holes through the floorboard and into the top of the frame rails on each side and the rear of the chassis. We drill six holes through the floorboard where it contacts the firewall. Six quarter inch diameter by one inch long bolts with flat washers on both sides along with lock washers and nuts are used to secure the front of the floor to the firewall. Using either a 5 16 inch hex washer head self-tapping screw, approximately one inch long, or a heavy pop rivet, we secure the floor to the frame. This completes our floorboard installation. In order for us to properly mount and support the emergency brake cable, we fabricate two metal plates, approximately one and a quarter inch long by one and a quarter inch wide from scrap steel. We measure forward on the side of the drive shaft tunnel, approximately four inches from the rear of the floor and one inch down from the top. We mark two diagonal holes through the plates to match the ones located in the emergency brake cable brackets attached to the emergency brake cable. After marking the floorboard with a china marker, we use our electric drill with a quarter inch drill bit and drill through the fiberglass. Utilizing quarter inch diameter by one inch long bolts along with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts, we secure the support plates through the fiberglass and cable brackets that have been placed against both sides of the inner drive shaft tunnel. The bolts are securely tightened. Using the Ford emergency brake yoke, we slide it over the cable and attach it to the emergency brake rod from underneath the car. We use the original nut to secure the rod to the yoke. Final adjustments can be made later. The end of the accelerator cable is pushed through the hole in the firewall from the engine compartment and the support bracket is bolted to the firewall.
The accelerator pedal is positioned in place and bolted securely to the firewall with the appropriate hardware. The pedal angle and height can be adjusted for individual preference. The cable slides into the notch in the accelerator bracket and is secured with the plastic retaining clip. If the cable is a little too long, a knot can be tied in the cable to take up any slack. Since we have chosen to use the optional air conditioning, we follow the instruction manual and the instructions that come with the unit. Steel mounting brackets for the evaporator blower unit are part of the chassis. The condenser mounts in front of the radiator and the compressor to the engine. Our compact heater that we obtained from the factory bolts directly to the firewall. Following the directions in the instruction manual, as well as those that come with the unit, all hose connections are made. Our rolling chassis has been completed. The original tires have been retained and will be used for most of the assembly. When our new replicar is completed, we will mount custom wheels and new tires. We elevate the front of the chassis with our floor jack placed under the center of the front cross member. The two front jack stands are removed and the chassis is lowered slowly to the ground. The floor jack is then placed under the center of the differential at the rear. The two jack stands are removed and the car is again lowered to the ground. At this point, our new chassis is ready for the new Mercedes SSK body that we are pre-assembling. It will slip right on the chassis. A few electrical connections in the engine compartment would allow us to start the engine, but first we are going to give the entire chassis a good coat of gloss black enamel paint. We prefer gloss enamel to a flat paint as it is easier to keep clean and we find that in general it is more durable. We will remember to recheck everything and torque all necessary bolts to original factory specifications before running the new vehicle. Also, we will have the car thoroughly inspected, the front end aligned and make any other necessary adjustments to meet all safety and emission requirements and standards before the car is driven. We can congratulate ourselves on a job well done.